Hi, it's Rachel with the Charlotte Mason Plenary here. Thank you for joining me for another episode of Finding Your Way with Charlotte Mason's 20 Principles. Today, we're going to talk about principles 16 through 19. Now, these principles deal with what Charlotte calls the way of the will and the way of the reason. Now, I'm going to read them all for you, and it, it might seem a little bit overwhelming to take all this info at once, but I'm going to break it down for you. There are three parts to this overarching idea about will and reason, and we'll go through each one separately. Okay, so here are principles 16 through 19. There are two guides to moral and intellectual self-management to offer to children, which we may call the way of the will and the way of the reason. The way of the will. Children should be taught A, to distinguish between I want and I will, B, that the way to will effectively is to turn our thoughts from that which we desire but do not will, C, that the best way to turn our thoughts is to think of or do some quite different thing entertaining or interesting, D, that after a little rest in this way, the will returns to its work with new vigor. This adjunct of the will is familiar to us as diversion, whose office it is to ease us for a time from will effort, that we may will again with added power. The use of suggestion as an aid to the will is to be deprecated, as tending to stultify and stereotype character. It would seem that spontaneity is a condition of development, and that human nature needs the discipline of failure as well as of success. The way of the reason. We teach children, too, not to lean too confidently to their own understanding, because the function of reason is to give logical demonstration A of mathematical truth, B of an initial idea accepted by the will. In the former case, reason is practically an infallible guide, but in the latter it is not always a safe one. For whether that idea be right or wrong, the reason will confirm it by irrefragable proofs. Therefore, children should be taught, as they become mature enough to understand such teaching, that the chief responsibility which rests on them as persons is the acceptance or rejection of ideas. To help them in this choice, we give them principles of conduct and a wide range of the knowledge fitted to them. These principles should save children from some of the loose thinking and heedless action which cause most of us to live at a lower level than we need. Okay, so let's take a look at the first part, the will. What do you think of when, when you hear the term will in relation to children? You might think of the term strong-willed child. There are so many books on this subject, and most of those books describe strong-willed children as argumentative, stubborn, defiant, in other words, our society sees a strong-willed child as a negative or something that needs to be fixed. Well, Charlotte disagrees, and she says it's important for children to learn the difference between I want and I will. So what our society describes as a strong will, Charlotte actually describes as a weak will. The weak-willed person is the person who lives off of desire, off of what they want rather than what is right, or is the person that just lets life happen and takes the path of least resistance. But the strong-willed person sees the choices before himself and makes himself or wills himself to do the right thing. And that is what Charlotte calls a strong will. The will has only one mode of action. Its function is to choose, and with every choice we make, we grow in force of character. It is time that we realize that to fortify the will is one of the great purposes of education, and probably some study of the map of the city of Mansoul would afford us guidance. Okay, two things. You might be wondering, what the heck is Mansoul and why do we need a map? Okay, so let me explain. Mansoul is a reference in and of itself to a book called The Holy War by John Bunyan, also the author of Pilgrim's Progress. And that was a book that Charlotte assigned in Form 1. 
So Charlotte takes this analogy of man's soul from the Holy War and uses it in a book that she wrote for students called Ourselves. So man's soul or man's soul is actually the location in the book. And to put it in its simplest terms, there are two entities fighting over the location man's soul in the book. And those two forces fighting are the forces of good and the forces of evil. So Charlotte uses this analogy um, in a way to teach character. And volume four, Ourselves, is, like I said, the only book written for students, not for parents, in her six volume home education series. So in a way, it is her treatise on character and self-government. And she's trying to show the student that the student is in charge or that the student has the power of self-governance and the power to will and do that which is right. Now, I love the way that Charlotte teaches character and she teaches it from the very beginning, but it's very subtle. And for students, it's a combination of living books and living ideas in those books and volume four ourselves. And for teachers or parents, it's the principles, what you're studying now. And when you combine the two, it is very, very powerful. I, I could talk about uh, Charlotte's, uh, the way she teaches character all day long, but that's probably uh, a story for another video. So getting back to the will, the purpose of education is to fortify the will or to make the will stronger in terms of character. His will is the safeguard of a man against the unlawful intrusion of other persons. We are taught that there are offenses against the bodies of others which may not be committed. But who teaches us that we may not intrude upon the minds and overrule the wills of others? That it is indecent to let another probe the thoughts of the unconscious mind, whether of child or man. Now the thought that we choose is commonly the thought that we ought to think. And the part of the teacher is to afford to each child a full reservoir of the right thought of the world to draw from. For right thinking is by no means a matter of self-expression. Right thought flows upon the stimulus of an idea, and ideas are stored, as we have seen, in books and pictures and the lives of men and nations. These instruct the conscience and stimulate the will, and the man or child chooses. But here's what Charlotte says about how character and the will are connected. The one achievement possible and necessary for every man is character, and character is as finely wrought metal beaten into shape and beauty by the repeated and accustomed action of will. Persons commonly suppose that the action of the will is automatic, but no power of man's soul acts by itself and of itself and some little study of way of the will, which has the ordering of every other power, may help us to understand the functions of this premier in the kingdom of Mansoul. We who teach should make it clear to ourselves that our aim in education is less conduct than character. Conduct may be arrived at, as we have seen, by indirect routes, but it is of value to the world only as it has its source in character. So the action taken by the will is what molds a person's character. Okay, so let's take a look at part two of these principles, the way of the reason. So Charlotte says how reason plays a part in supporting the will in whatever decisions it makes. It's the job of the will to either accept or reject ideas, and it's the job of reason to support the will in those decisions but reason is fallible. It comes to the aid of the will to support it in whatever idea it has accepted, whether it's a good idea or a bad idea. But reason never begins it. It is always a servant to the will. Reason never begins it. It is only when the student chooses to think about some course or plan that reason comes into play. So, if he chooses to think about a purpose that is good, many excellent reasons will hurry up to support him. 
But alas, if he choose to entertain a wrong notion, he, as it were, rings the bell for reason, which enforces his wrong intention with the score of arguments proving that wrong is right. Charlotte gives many examples of reason gone wrong, including Shakespeare's play Macbeth, and she even goes into a whole long thing about Karl Marx's uh, Communist Manifesto. But she says the will must be strong enough to reject the ideas that are wrong. Though the will affects all our actions and all our thoughts, its direct action is confined to a very little place, to that postern at either side of which stand conscience and reason, and at which ideas must needs present themselves. Shall we take an idea in or reject it? Conscience and reason have their say, but will is supreme, and the behavior of will is determined by all the principles we have gathered, all the opinions we have formed. But suppose an unworthy idea presents itself at the postern, supported by public opinion, by reason, for which even conscience finds pleas. The will soon wearies of opposition, and what is to be done? So I would like to cite a more modern day example of how reason and will, when educated without morality, can have terrible consequences. Now this next quote is a bit explicit, so if you have young children around, you might want to pause the video here and put in some headphones. The words from the quote will also appear on the screen, so make sure young children are not in viewing range. I'll wait while you pause the video. Okay, we'll continue on now. Here's the quote I want to share with you. On the first day of a new school year, all the teachers in one private school received the following note from their principal. Dear teachers, I am a survivor of a concentration camp. My eyes saw what no person should witness. Gas chambers built by learned engineers. Children poisoned by educated physicians infants killed by trained nurses, women and babies shot and burned by high school and college graduates. So I am suspicious of education. My request is, help your students become more human. Your efforts must never produce learned monsters, skilled psychopaths, or educated Eichmanns. Reading, writing, and arithmetic are important only if they serve to make our children more humane. It is the humanness or the humaneness that matters, so education must include morality and the building of a moral character. So now let's take a look at part three of this equation. Therefore, children should be taught, as they become mature enough to understand such teaching, that the chief responsibility which rests on them as persons is the acceptance or rejection of ideas. To help them in this choice, we give them principles of conduct and a wide range of the knowledge fitted to them. So children need practice in identifying fallacies. They need material to work on and finding those ideas which might not be correct. Um, in other words, we're supposed to give children examples um, and then help them to not only see the fallacies, but then to choose right thinking and right acting. Um, and where do we get these examples? From living books. It's, it's so simple. <laughs> Um, when you have living books in an education, you have all of those moral ideas. Um, the essence of a living book is that it contains ideas that are so important and so foundational that you cannot help but to shape character. The ordering of the will is not an affair of sudden resolve. It is the outcome of a slow and ordered education in which precept and example flow in from the lives and thoughts of other men, men of antiquity and men of the hour, as unconsciously and spontaneously as the air we breathe. The gradual fortifying of the will, which many a schoolboy undergoes, is hardly perceptible to himself however tremendous the results may be for his city or his nation. 
Will, free will, must have an object outside of self. Will is the one free agent of man's soul. Will alone may accept or reject, and will is therefore responsible for every intellectual problem which has proved too much for a man's sanity or for his moral probity. We may not think what we please on shallow matters or profound. The instructed conscience and trained reason support the will in those things, little and great, by which men live. So in those few quotes, you have the tremendous results of the way of the will and the way of the reason. I hope this video has helped you to understand a little bit better these ideas, which can seem a little tricky at first. Okay, so your homework is to read the chapters that go with these principles. You can download it over on the plenary website. I will put a link to it uh, in the description of this video. And then to answer the questions in the study guide about these principles. So, okay, just one more to go. We're almost there. I'll see you next time for principle 20.